As you all know, Philip Seymour Hoffman tragically died from a drug overdose. Uh, he was found with a syringe in his arm and he was um, injecting himself with heroin. Now, a New York Post columnist by the name of Andrea Peisner uh, wrote a piece where she was discussing how she doesn't have that much sympathy for him. Uh, she talks about how we need to stop treating him as though he was a victim of a disease and we should look at him as an adult, as an adult who made a decision, who made a choice to inject himself with heroin. Um, now, a lot of people were upset at the way he, she covered this, and she doesn't agree that addiction should be classified as a disease. And I wanted to open this uh, topic up to you guys to see what you think. Chris, do you think that it's unfair uh, to label addiction as a disease? Or do you see this as you know, a choice that he made and we should stop treating him as a victim? Well, uh, a good friend of mine, Stanton Peel, uh, is one of the most prominent advocates for against the disease model of addiction. Uh, he's been arguing this for 30 years. And I'm pretty, con I'm pretty convinced by the way he uh, talks about this because most, if you call addiction a disease, it takes away power from the person. It, it creates a hel helplessness in the person because they say, well, I've got a disease. There is a great South Park episode about this. I don't know if you've, see you've seen that. Um, it, it, it makes the person helpless against their disease. I have cancer, I have, I have addiction. Oh, what can I do? Give me another beer, right? Um, but I think the main problem with Philip Seymour Hoffman's situation and with heroin in general is something uh, that comes back to the legal system again and, and inspiring fear versus respect. The problem with heroin is it's a white powder. Now, some people are suffering. They use heroin to alleviate their suffering. We can talk about that as the disease. We can talk about that as psychological trauma. We can talk about that as biochemistry. It doesn't really matter. The point is they're suffering they find relief in this substance. Why can't they have a safe supply of that substance? Whom are they hurting? Yeah. Nobody, right? Now the problem with heroin is it's a white powder. So if, if it's five times as strong as the powder you bought last week, there's no way to know. Of course, it's so unregulated. You, yeah. So you cannot, and they mix stuff in with it. There's a new drug they're mixing in that's like 100 times stronger than heroin. So you don't know what you're getting. That's what people die from. Yeah. They're not dying from heroin. William S. Burroughs was a junkie his whole life. He lived into his 80s. It's possible if you have a clean supply of heroin, it's possible to live a long, healthy life. The problem is the legal system. Yeah, I have a problem with this kind of binary view that everybody seems to have, that it has to be one or the other. Either this if, is, if this is a de disease, we're supposed to look at it like uh, you're uh, completely victimized by it, you can't do anything. And I disagree with your viewpoint that, oh, all of a sudden you're labeled w as having cancer, that makes you a victim, what am I gonna do? You're gonna fucking fight the cancer, that's what most people do. A lot of people who get a diagnosis now feel empowered because they finally know what's going on with them, and I think that if drug addicts can go into treatment where they start to understand the scope of the psychiatric addiction and understand the scope of why they're taking these drugs, they can actually feel empowered, not victimized, and they can start to do something about it. But yes, of course, he is also an adult, mm -hmm. and he also did make decisions. And anybody who is an adult user mm -hmm is both of those things. Why can't we view this as a very cloudy issue? That yes, you are suffering from addiction, but you're also choosing to continue that habit. Not that it's a very easy decision to make, right. but you're choosing, let's say, to continue the habit instead of continuing with treatment. And yes, people fall off the wagon. Yes, almost every time somebody goes in for drug treatment, they relapse and they have to go back, but that's the process and that's yeah. the nature I, of I this disease. Uh, Peter, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take go the middle ground here between these two here, mm -hmm. so in the middle. Um, I wouldn't, I would, I wouldn't really worry about calling it a disease or an illness. I would sort of more say it's a susceptibility because mm -hmm. a disease and an illness you may actually cure and get rid of. But if you're susceptible to being an addict, you're gonna be susceptible for the entirety of your life. I mean, uh, that's not gonna go away. And what you have to realize is that we're all variable and different drugs affect us in different ways. And the example that I often give is, is just think about the most intense pleasure you've ever had in your life. Mm -hmm. That moment of most intense pleasure. That was your brain chemistry. Mm -hmm. That was your brain releasing serotonin, dopamine, and doing other, making other things. 
And for some people, again, your brain just doesn't produce enough, or there isn't enough receptors to do it. And what drugs do is they, they, they give you that extra bang. And for most people, they can do heroin and they can walk away from it. They don't turn into addicts. Most people can do cocaine and walk away from it, don't turn into addicts. Some people do. And those people oftentimes may have sort of susceptibility. And so the, the effect of the heroin, the effect of the cocaine, is like that most incredible feeling you've ever had. And that's hard to walk away from. But and so people are susceptible. I think this difference, though, and I know it's just a, a, a verbal difference, but between using the word disease, illness, susceptibility, I think it's because most people don't understand the disease yeah. process. Cancer, nobody argues, is a disease. You cannot cure cancer. You can treat cancer. You can remove cancerous cells. But the process of cancer does not have a cure and probably will never have a cure. We will just have we better, that. clearer yes. treatment. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Um, and it's the same thing with something like HIV. The way to to cure HIV would be to clear the virus completely mm -hmm. from your body, but most of the time what we're really doing is we're treating it or we're slowing it down. And so I think that if we understood the disease process, which is varied across all different types of infections or illnesses, that this it's not such a bad thing to call this a disease or an illness because it's just one of those spectral things within that process. Yeah, you're predisposed to the addiction and, and so... I. I you obviously have something different about you from regular people. You're predisposed, you're more likely to be addicted to a substance. And, and then you may have environmental factors in your yeah. life that completely kick out. And it's that. not all about self-control. Oh, you know, we're all the same. He just doesn't have self-control, and right. that's the difference. And that's a yeah. huge that's argument for obesity, a lot of people yeah. will say. You yeah. look at people who are morbidly obese, who've been frustrated and suffering with it their entire lives. Yes, for some people, they made bad choices. For other people, they can't fucking help but make those choices. And yeah. also, let's look at the cultural background. I just read a, a scientific scientific paper arguing that the, uh, the background uh, antibiotic load on the livestock supply in the United States is um, altering the microfauna of the digestive system of human beings, mm -hmm. which often relate, uh, results in obesity. Yeah. So you can also apply that to addiction. You can say, well, we live in a society that is, there are obviously a lot of serious problems, and it's the, I don't want to plug my book that I haven't written yet, but that's <laughs> what it's going to be about. Uh, and, uh, you know, so why are we blaming addicts? Why, why, for example, with heroin, people who have terminal illness, they're dying, they've got six months to live, they still can't have enough painkillers so that they don't die in pain yeah. because of our heroin paranoia. Heroin does not kill people, especially people who are already terminally ill. Let's chill out about yeah. heroin. So I want to end the conversation by addressing that point, and I think that's the most relevant thing to take away from uh, Hoffman's death. If you have a system that legalizes and regulates these drugs, you can ensure that you minimize the amount of people that overdose, right? You will make sure that these drugs aren't laced with other things. I mean, how many people have died recently because of so-called bad heroin that have been laced with um, certain drugs that are given to terminally ill cancer patients, right? It's a pain medication. And you don't know what you're going to get. If you legalize it and regulate it, people know what they're taking. And also, it leads to a decline in the number of people that are taking these drugs. I mean, you see it in Portugal. You see it in other uh, countries that have decriminalized the drug. Um, so I think that you have to take away from stories like this. You have to use it as an example of how we can change our domestic policy. And one good way of doing that is legalizing in my book.